I'll ask you, Tom. Is data an asset? Let's get this out of the way first. Well, I was talking about this could be a very short conversation, but data is definitely an asset. The question is, in what context do we find data valuable to ourselves versus in what context is data valuable to corporations, right? And how we exchange the value of that data, I think, is the really, really uh, sort of interesting part of this discussion. Do you think senior leadership has a, an understanding about how to use it and how to discover the, the opportunities that can be related to a, a good data set? I, I'm not sure that all senior leadership teams quite recognise yet the role that they need to play. The really tricky thing about really getting value out of data uh, is making sure that you have some standardised approaches across the organisation. Um, and that requires senior leadership sponsorship to be successful. Uh, actually, data management is everyone's business and that starts from the top. Mm -hmm. Okay, so Tom, you've told us that it's all very valuable. Um, <laughs> but uh, do, do you agree that this, this extends all the way through organisations? Like I was saying, different organizations will value data at different levels. But once again, I come at, from it from a retail context. Mm -hmm. uh, in retail, um, this, there's an old uh, marketing ap approach where you talk about market segmentation. Okay? But everybody who's in retail, I would argue, understands that these days, market segmentation, micro segmentation is not enough. It's around personalization. Personalization is market segmentation to the, to the extreme level, to you as the individual. And personalization, when we talk about retail, okay, is really uh, necessary because retail is about product prices and customer experiences. Mm -hmm. In a flattening uh, world where retail products, retail prices, all look and feel somewhat the same, Right? It's around that personalization of the customer experience, that personalization of the customer journey. So you have, you have to have mm. data as an asset. And then once again, I talk about it from a retail perspective. Data literacy does vary a lot. I mean, this is the critical thing, right? Um, and if, we're, if we had substantially better data literacy, we would be in a better place to take advantage of the asset so, and you see examples everywhere. If you're a, an engineer and you're in a gas and oil company and you're you know, designing a piece of machinery that's gonna end up in a gas and oil platform or somewhere, you're using data to solve that problem. And, uh, and I'm not saying this isn't the case, but in most cases, your data literacy as it relates to the rest of the organization is low. As you pull this thing into the system without thinking, I am the shepherd of the data this thing creates, I am the owner, it's gonna do things for others, so I'm gonna set it up in a way that this is more useful down the, down the chain. And if everybody in that chain, all the way to somebody doing a schedule to do an audit on a whole rather than the piece, suddenly becomes normally an incredibly difficult problem because the literacy all the way back to that thing is so low, right? Mm -hmm. So now suddenly you become a, the Indiana Jones of data just to figure out how that thing connected to all these other things and it's going to help me do the scheduling of this audit better and is the audit telling me something safe or unsafe. And retail is a quite specific example, but in most industries, banking is the same, you do have this problem that, um, that we've used, you use data and created data over many, many years for a purpose. Suddenly now we're all deciding that it's an asset and we should use it for many more purposes, but this thing hasn't been set up for that and people haven't been educated for that. So those two things like, have to come together before the, the promise of the asset. And we haven't gone into value, but there's a lot of studies about identifying what value looks like from the asset, which are mind-boggling. Is it optimistic to think that most CEOs would want to spend their time learning about how to handle data? Or is it easier to say, well, actually, no, I'm in control of the majority of the company in different ways. Mm. Maybe I don't need to know. My experience from many, many CEOs is that, yeah, they, 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 if given the chance, they'll go, they'll go and learn, they'll go and be educated. Mm. There'll be some exceptions here and there, but in most cases, they think they are. Ah. Yeah, Which thinking is you are is, is da dangerous, isn't it? So the really interesting thing is, is that not only do you need to educate your chief executive, but you need to, if you take your theory further, educate every single member of the organisation to think as a data owner. And actually, it's asking quite a lot of every member of staff to think in terms of, uh, I have a particular need for this piece of data, but I want to try and anticipate every possible need that every possible colleague could have anywhere in the world for this same piece of data and make sure that I don't create a dead end for them when they eventually get to use this piece of data. That's a big ask. Is there a way of achieving that? I'm seeing it. 
yeah. and, it's, it, and it moves across time. And there's great examples in the history, the, the, the BBVAs of the world, the Spanish bank, who's incredibly debt illiterate, but they've gone through an, emo an emotional and transformative time to get there. And perfection doesn't exist, but they've, they've come to the, this balance of perfection is the enemy of good, but we're going for good, and they've got great, I think. Okay. So you can get it done. Um, the motivations do change, and there's a generational change as well. So the younger the organization in terms of how it wants to do things, it feels like it's more willing to make those changes. So, I mean, certainly in Accenture, there's half a you know, million of us. We definitely have that data is important mentality, and I want to use it, and I want to share it, and how do I make it? Changing the DNA helps in bringing everybody for the journey. In Agile, which is you can't make a company Agile just by saying they're all going to be Agile. Oh. You've got to train them to do this and, and nurture it and try to make it work. So for the companies where they've gone for, let's change the DNA so people understand the, the value of data as in it's a valuable thing, let's, let's use it well, tend to do well. The ones that have said data is valuable, you, you need to be data driven, have not. So the key then is when data is a means to an end, not an end in its own right. And when you get people really thinking about how they're going to consume data and how they're actually going to get value from it, that's when you start to get that data ownership that flows from data understanding and, and responsibility and accountability. So, for example, in one of the organisations that I worked in, we had some very standardised rules around data ownership and so on, but we made sure that data ownership resided as close as possible to the point of consumption. Who were the people that really cared about this particular piece of data? And if they were the people that cared about it, the chances were they were going to make sure that it follows certain standards and so on. And so our concept for data management was around freedom within a framework. There's a very clear framework and a set of standards and some agreed ways of doing things around here, but you get to go play where it matters to you and your part of the business. So each business unit, several hundred business units, each consumed data locally in their own way according to standardized patterns but in a very very specific way that was relevant to their business and that was the best balance that I've seen between some standardization and one controlling mind thinking about the use of data included alongside a democratization of the use of that data and genuine ownership um, as close as possible to the customer. Quite. Hmm, interesting and so was it easy to um, bring a culture of data ownership through an organization or is that something that is a, a challenge to, to say to people who maybe don't feel connected to, you know, there are many people who work in roles where they just don't feel connected to a database but they realize data fuels their company. So how yeah. do you help them feel connected? Well, it's so tricky, isn't it? Because different people will view the same piece of data in different ways. Mm. So you get into debates like, when is a customer a customer, for example? We've all, we've all been there. Um, and you know, your top sales guy will say that a customer is the guy he's about to mm. sign next week, but he hasn't quite yet signed. But it, trust me, it's a customer. Your finance team will say mm. a customer isn't a customer until the check's cleared. You know? So getting really clear on that, on that definition of, of, mm. of all of your terms and, and what you all mean is, is, is key. But then if you enable people to think about how they're going to use that data, those standardized mm. terms start to become more relevant and, uh, and meaningful rather than just another table and another set of policies and rules and regulations. Interestingly, and this is, again, Tom and I have these discussions every now and then, retail is a really good example of great use of data as a matter of interest. But So no data, or not all data is the same, right? So you land in a company, in a bank, and data is just this amorphous, enormous thing that takes the shape of the thousands of databases when it's nice and square, um, you know, files when it's not very square, uh, you know, just pure text, as Tom and I have had experience in our previous lives, where it's just blah, it's just blah. Um, and, uh, and we tend to speak about it at a high level that we're doing today in a very holistic way, like all this is stuff exploitable. And, and the truth is, it translates to some, some, and I'm going to say this in the most generous way, some poor IT people who are actually translating this amorphous uh, data as a value to, OK, in order to try and do what you think you want to do, I can't take this thing and, you, and store it the way you're asking me. I can't. I can't take uh, a database, and I can't ask it intelligent questions that the database doesn't answer. I can't, uh, the example you and I were talking about before, I can't put all the knowledge of a firm that is unstructured text and stuff like that into what, a search engine and hope the thing is going to give me an answer. Won't work. So this, this, for me, this disconnect is fundamental. The data education for me is part of decrypting that. It is a, hey, we all, we got these things called legacy systems where we, they were systems of record, you know, we added the customer name and it went in there and it was all good, life was good. 
And then we've got the evolution over time of how we want to use that. And that thing no longer works the way we want to, but it still keeps track of something. So we need to evolve that data. So the bigger the company, the more these flavors exist. The more these issues exist, the big data revolution of let's stick everything in this lake thing obviously has more or less failed. But again, because you were trying to move everything from their place to a place without, in most cases, thinking, how can I extract it? Tom, your example of retail is fabulous in the sense that actually it's such a lifeblood that all of this is kind of working. But in most other places, it's the, and the next evolution is now, there's this cloud thing. Let's take this amorphous thing again without the right questions, to your point, Sarah, the questions we ask, which are the important things. And let's just move it over there because we're going to be able to answer these questions. And this whole cycle is, is, is yeah. fairly brutal. And I think one of the things that uh, when, when you're talking about law organizations and their journeys, okay, um, you can talk about data, but it's actually more useful to talk about data as a product mm. or sets of products yeah, yeah, yeah. because then it takes this amorphous blob of data right, and actually makes it concrete to a business function to that end user, that person that uses Excel right, or use, you, you know, do, does their business role daily mm. because now I have a product that resides in a business function and it's governed by a certain set of rules, right? But like, you know, in, in the more general sense, when we talk about data, okay, uh, we can bring it through sort of data governance mechanism, mm -hmm. right? And that's sort of the, the beginnings of a company on that data journey yeah. because governance doesn't really mean data literacy in, in a certain right. sense, right? Mm -hmm. You don't gain data literacy by pushing down Correct. governance because governance is a bad word, right? What you really want to do is make it relevant for the business, that business function and say, you know, here's the governance, right? But the reason why there's the governance is because you're creating data products that you use in your everyday, you know, work. Work, right. Right, so. So that's context, right? That's context. But then the scaffolding. Yes. Yeah. So then the scaffolding is, you do need governance as a piece of your scaffolding or you're in big trouble. You need quality you need ingestion, you need prioritization. You need, so there's a bunch of, these are very, you guys know, these are data specific things, but um, we haven't got an A plus in, in scaffolding, never mind in filling then the scaffolding, yeah. right? Which is the scaffolding, the product is all of it. So I'm totally with you when there's a product, but again, retail is such a great example of things that work in most cases, uh, you know, because if the bananas all go rotten, you ain't got a business. But in other places, it seems to, the, the secondary concern, so turning it back and saying, what are the products and services that you could build and should build that are driven by data? Yeah. It seems to be a better pattern of solving and building a scaffolding than build the scaffolding and they will come. I, I think know, you lose your yeah. energy. You can never sustain the energy. For yeah, that and either. you never get there. Uh, yeah, and you, d you just don't get there. Um, and I think that's right. And I think you can take the questioning even further upstream. So if you, if you start by thinking, what are we trying to achieve as an organization? What are our strategic goals? And to what extent will our use of data influence them and, and, and improve on them? And sometimes data won't be the answer. Uh, but quite, usually quite, quite, it will. Um, so don't start with data as the end. Uh, start with what you're trying to achieve. Is, is, and then you get pull through. Then, then you start to think, right, okay, how can we now do this? Uh, you know, a completely different example where actually data as a valuable asset but not necessarily with pound signs attached to it is in the world of health and safety mm. so uh, at one of my previous organizations health and safety was everything and it was the single most important strategic goal how do we achieve a, mm. a, a corporate strategy of zero harm to our people mm. um, and then we asked ourselves how could we use data to achieve that can we should we try and use data and initially we weren't immediately clear how but then developed some really interesting proofs of concept where we got to the stage where we could predict uh, to the date time physical location location on a plant to the nearest body part mm. what particular injury might in be inflicted on a particular person Quite as they carried out a particular piece of work on a particular given day and that meant that we could give better training in advance of them doing that piece of work and that was through taking a ton of historical data yeah, and running yeah, the algorithms yeah, so what an interesting way of being able to actually say here's data as an asset of, of achieving a, a strategic goal that's got nothing to do with pounds but it's much more important you're back to DNA right? right so if you're talking about uh, energy companies or gas and oil companies where if you've never worked in one you go to one of their offices you're t going up the stairs and somebody will literally say Get hold your the hand handrail hold the handrail you got it and they're not saying it because it's a it literally is embedded in the DNA they, they mean it mm -hmm. put yep. your hand on it so uh, I think you've touched on something really important which is if you try once you start getting into this if you do attach your products 
to something that is part of the DNA. Yeah. People come with you. This is not a foreign concept. Safety is such an important thing. We actually, honest to God, care so much that, yeah. again, another example from that industry is you start every meeting with a note on not what is health and safety. It's my own personal experience of health and safety this week. Yep. I was driving down the road and I yeah. saw this. and I did. It's really, so that's fundamental. I really like that example. But not all industries have a guiding North Star that is such a strong thing. Okay. Think about industries, I don't know, think about financial services where the product you're creating is slightly difficult to even understand. It's a compound of other financial instruments. And you get this, you separate yourself from the reality of the world. So how can you motivate people to do that? And there it requires, a, and I call it the CIO conundrum, which is the CIO saying, this data day has value, I know it has value. Okay, good luck. <sighs> good luck, it doesn't always have value. Yeah. So there I think it requires leaders to have an even, even more clarity around what they're looking for mm. and ways to, to explain it. Your example is brilliant, but you're sitting there trying to define how to optimize a trading floor. And it might well be, actually, all, uh, this is a real example. You know, most traders are, are good at their job, but they're running so fast, they don't always kind of close their paperwork and stuff. What, if we could kind of go behind and, and you know, try to help them, hey, you've closed this set of trades, you know, have you done the paperwork, you know, can we do it for them? That's a brilliant example of some of these non-fabricated, real examples in complex scenarios. Yeah. Most of my experience with data, when you actually look at the list of things people want to do with them, there's a large percentage of use cases where it's just, it lacks that clarity of your example right. on safety. Yeah. So we shouldn't be surprised that then all of the execution is very tough yeah. when you can't relate to the problem. Again, Tom, your problem is it's in your world, it's relatable almost oh, yeah. every time. And people get it so much. In healthcare, yeah. it's you know, immediately relatable. So I mean, my question for you, Sarah, though, is mm -hmm. in, even then, in in healthcare, we don't always see it see it working. Sure. For example, right. So, clarity of purpose then is is, is your point. Being really mm -hmm. clear on what questions you're you're you're, you're yeah. trying to answer. But then, of course, the power of data can then be the flip side of that same question, which is one of the questions that you aren't able to even contemplate today that you might be able to contemplate tomorrow with the use of data. And that's asking a lot of your organisation to start being able to to think like yeah. that. I, I think though. Sorry, I, I think that's where. Um, there's, there's a different aspect, and it's more technical aspect of a data scaffolding. Okay. Right? Because um, uh, how a customer or, or a data product is represented in each business function would actually potentially be very different. Okay. But what you want to do is keep the core elements of it pure, mm. right? So that if the business evolves over time, mm. right, you still have something to come back to, right? Like a version zero of your data, right, of your, your, of your data yeah, product. Yeah. Because this is where, you know, um, from the, you call it the raw data, right? You, you have to be able to make sure that you can explore new avenues with that, yeah. yeah? So like this is where, once again, a more technical aspect of the scaffolding really does come into place, right? Quite. And you call it governance or whatnot, but, you know, in order to make sure that the data is ready right, yeah, yeah. for anything in the future, you all, I think it's, I, I know Fernando just said, data lakes don't work. I think that's where the data lake Yours works. does come in, right? Yeah. So, <laughs> yeah. And the foundations have to be secure. Found, yeah, yeah. Absolutely. Yeah. And then you've got the time variable of, of value, which is, is, is I've lived in the last week. So when you have people that say, well, I need to be using real time data. And obviously all the people that back to our scaffolding, our technology scaffolding, people look at each other going, oh my God, these people are mad. You know, they don't even know what they're talking about. So taking away the idea of real time being actual real time as human beings will understand it, but quicker, writer, it becomes again uh, a, a bit of a fad. Uh, how much data can you literally use in real time that somebody would care about that time element? Mm -hmm. How much of that is, is, is putting a lot of pressure on the firm to build a scaffolding that is just immensely complex to deal with a real time problem? without the clarity of vision of why you need it. Yeah. So, and it's, and it's really easy to fall into that trap where you think, well, I'm a, I'm a, I'm a bank, for example, and I want to be able to, to delight my customer with uh, real-time moments. Get it. Yeah. How many real-time moments matter? Yeah. You know, and you start going, if you go deep there, to your point before, so you go really deep into that, what really matters is important so you don't end up with, in the case of real-time data, which is really difficult and costly, with an enormous technology framework mm. to deal with 
that might be over engineered maybe that's and no longer important. proportionate. But is it worthwhile when, you know, if we're getting a, a sort of connected enterprise now, so we're getting lots of different data formats from lots of different sources, mm. whether they're internal, whether it's customer data, this, this lake starting to sound vast and also incalculable in many ways. Mm. Is it becoming overwhelming? Is it too expensive to deal with that much data with so many different possible use cases? You, know, you could probably mm. find a way to debate that there's something that's going to be in there and it's definitely going to be worthwhile. How do you manage that? Clarity. Clarity. Back to clarity. Every time I, we end up as a, as a firm in these situations, it is about imposing a set of clarity, simplification, thinking. You, you talked about democracy. So actually, in some cases, just letting the edges do what they need to do and not having to try to you know, centralize ideas. Uh, Tom and I have discussed hub and spoke models many times. There's plenty of mechanisms, but no, I don't think it's overwhelming at all. It's overwhelming when you're the CEO or the CIO and the noise you're getting and the perception you're getting is that it's overwhelming. But as you filter down the functions, I suspect the edges are fine doing what they need because they've always done it, right? The branch at, uh, at uh, the bank over there is still doing what they need to do. Um, there's a middle where you actually want to use in information from this that is siloed that is a little bit difficult. So the more that we can have clarity about the things we do, and we were talking to the Thames Water folks before where they have immense clarity about what good looks like, then it, it's not quite so overwhelming. Um, um, I, I think it's really, to, I, I, I hate to just use the overall word governance around it, mm. but data evolves. As long as you def define a pattern for evolution or around your data, okay, I think you can always come back to a uh, starting point. Right, and that's really important as you become a more data-driven, data-led organization. Okay, the interesting part, I think, though, when we talk about all this at data as an asset, right, is what happens, right, when your machines or your humans start deriving new data assets. Okay, so we talked about the system, the ecosystem generating data and our collection of data, right? And that type of data, right, we can store, we can model, we can evolve, right, we can version. But what if we take all of our data and create new data, okay? Now, how do we govern that new set of secondary attributes, secondary, you know, sets of data, like, because they're not first order data attributes anymore. They're second no, no. order data attributes. And now you actually get into some real thorny problems that I would say, you know, as leaders in technology, right, or people sitting on boards that you're like, uh, how do I get my head wrapped around that, right? Because I, I haven't even solved my first order data questions yet. And like the organization's already sprinting along, right? And be because they have to. Right? In order to use data, you define a data product, but in that data product, more likely than not, you will create composite right, data attributes, mm. which are second order data mm. elements. How do you manage that? Data ownership is a big one at the yeah. moment. And yeah. I, there's plenty of studies, academic studies on the value of data, and they're all say mind boggling. The truth is, half of the times you go into a company and you think about the problems they have, they've got you know, scaffolding problems. Um, a feeling inadequate problem, which is, well, we should be doing all this stuff with data, we're not doing it, others are doing it, so now I feel inadequate. And the truth is, you know, you're probably plodding along at the same speed as all the others. Back to our conversation before, everybody exaggerates, right? And thus you feel inadequate because everybody's exaggerating. And I keep on seeing this behavior in very large companies where they continuously, the feedback up to the leadership on data seems to constantly be that of inadequacy. And there's constantly this negative thing that goes up as opposed to the, it's big, it's, you know, we've been buying companies forever, so we're a compound of a lot of things. We have ambitions, and hey, we're not doing bad for the ambitions that we've got. We could be doing better. So turning that into a positive rather than the feeling of inadequacy, when I mean, we're joking and calling it a scaffolding, this is, if it was scaffolding, it'd be like nasty, <laughs> nasty. Because as we've said before, not all data is the same, so it's not a perfect square thing that holds around a building. 
it's kind of a, you know, difficult and connected and normal things are designed to connect to each other and we have to bridge them and all this and we, and we have lakes and we have clouds and we have whatever the next evolution is. Entire weather system. Mm -hmm. Correct. So how do we turn this, you know, this, um, this complex scaffolding into a, into a story of positivism and data is great and we think it has value and we're setting ourselves up in a way, you, you've given a great example of democratizing it and trying to just, you know, rather than a, a story of persistent IT flavor of failure, but it's not. It really isn't. That's so interesting. So we're getting into organizational confidence, aren't we? And, yes. And, and actually, you're right. There's so much hype uh, around data that everybody feels inferior and, and insecure compared to everybody else. And so actually, to really get value out of data, you need to somehow shift the DNA of, of, of the organizational culture. You need to reduce organizational ego. You need to be more humble, more modest, more willing to say as an organization, we got that wrong. Yes. Uh, for example, and that's the only way to test and learn and use your data, develop hypotheses. Some of those hypotheses will be wrong. And having a sufficiently low organizational ego that you can climb down from your incorrect hypothesis uh, and accept that you got it wrong and try a different route is, is key to that very flexible, valuable way of, of, of using data. But that's asking a lot of an organization, that's asking a lot Quite. of a leadership team to say, actually, uh, we're getting there on a journey. You know, this is, this is difficult. Quite. One way, uh, the language that we used in, uh, in another data project that, that I led was that we talked about the lump under the carpet. Yeah. And the lump under the carpet was a very large lump to start with, and it was the lump of all of the data that we hadn't yet standardized, put scaffolding around, consolidated, made accessible, made reliable, and, uh, uh, and made secure. Um, and it was a very, very large lump. But we had some good hypotheses around a very small lump that we brought out from under the carpet. Yeah. We swept it in, and we swept it into our new data warehouse, and we started to get value out of it. And slowly but surely, the lump under the carpet started to reduce. And that was literally the language that we used as a way of socializing, yeah. accepting that actually, of course, you can't get there on day one, but slowly yeah. but surely that, that carpet will become flat. We also compare ourselves in some <coughs> cases to, to some of the American giants who, frankly, are not doing that great, but we've, uh, we've idolized some of these things. And when you think back on it, and some of us have worked in these companies and we have some idea what goes on inside, but I think it's a terrible benchmark to, to, for, for many companies who, frankly, you know, didn't start with one single product, didn't start with one single store of data, and so on. So I love the idea of just being very clear about there's a, there's a bunch of things we need to do better with, and, and let's... So, and I will tell you, observationally, for the firms that, that, that are, because all firms have similar problems, but the ones that have a very positive attitude towards mm -hmm. this change, and an understanding that this whole evolution of technology at the moment towards the cloud situation and so on, is actually good for us because it'll give us a little bit more latitude when we fail a little bit, you know, it's more forgiving. So maybe we can make the lump smaller and it's positive and it's, it's, a, it's a new opportunity and it's a world of change. Do better than, again, being really constrictive and restrictive and pedantic and, you know, programs that last multi-years and uh, people have, uh, you know, institutional, you know, either boredom or just they're just worn to the bone, right? Um, those do less well. You can, you can clearly see, and I love your views, are businesses, parts of the business just not really wanting to use those things or my favorite, working around them, finding their own way to do it. Yeah, around. always. So this, you see, you do see this, this, and I love your organizational sort of ethos kind of thing, where the positive, go with it, change, evolve, understand, organize yourself towards that, do well, maybe it's obvious, than the prescriptive, this is the way it's going to get done, three-year program, and we're going to make this work or bust. Mm -hmm. uh, I don't, I, that's not working. Yeah, okay. Do you think there is an, an issue with uh, public perception of, of data? So from the outside, if you're not working with, with data sets or, or teams who do this, the, the headlines that we hear about data is when it leaks, uh, when it goes wrong, you know, when it's being collected and we don't know about it. There's a lot of negative work that's done. And also when, when there is a data product and when in some ways that goes wrong, but in fact the result was learning, not <laughs> another product. Do you think that public awareness around data actually helps at all when it comes to being experimental and finding solutions when you're working with, with data? 
I think, so for example, if you take the GDPR, lots of organisations will say that they feel, feel very constrained by it, and, and, and of course they do. I think it's a wonderful thing for the consumer, and organisations will evolve to respond to it. And it's just another context, for example, that we operate in, that we will adjust to and, and uh, find ways to use data respectfully and in a trust-inspiring way for the benefit of our end customers, and in a way that is to their benefit and not to the corporate's um, own, own benefit. And that can only be a good thing. It's a headache, it makes you scratch your head, but surely only good can come from that, is my kind of optimistic view. I think the growing awareness of uh, the consumer around data actually adds a different dimension, right? The, the government, right, uh, the European government in creating GDPR provides governance around that, but the growing awareness of the consumer in that their data being is, is being used, being exploited, being experimented on, okay, I think that may add a um, different dimension, right, which is, uh, Fernando and I were talking about this, there are some uh, organizations out there right now that now um, take your data, okay, centralize it, and then allow you to sell your data, like you selling your data, not experience selling your data, right? So that you are in control of all your data elements, your data attributes, and if that you, as a data object or the data product, right, you can choose how, when, your data is shared, how is it being experimented on? So, Does that work mm -hmm. in, a, in a technical sense? I mean, if you take the ownership from the, the organization and the processes that are being applied and give it to people, and goodness knows people are chaotic. You know, do you not just open this up to a, a world of, of chaos that's going to make your job a lot more difficult if you're working with data? You're not going to get nice clean swathes of mm. of information that you know you can prove may help your customer in the end because they're starting from a point of well no this is mine so Gosh, that's very dangerous so, so if you think about it uh, that your bank knows more about you than any of the social media companies and any of the american you should know that that's the case if they're using it in a way that you don't agree mm -hmm. you should know about it. it doesn't matter what the burden on them is they'll sort it out we are um, at least in my observation, incredibly thrifty human beings uh, and technology vendors will create products for all sorts of different things that have problems. GDPR was an excuse for an entire market of products. Oh, wasn't it and uh, every company that sells you a database came up with a GDPR thing and, and well, providers like us did as well. And every, so I don't think this is a problem. If there's a, what's important though, and I think to Tom's point, is that suddenly you have this, let's have a better awareness that my bank knows more about me than anybody else, certainly know about it. If they're suddenly thinking of selling that or giving, or I don't care about how it's done, sharing that information about me with anyone and anyone for a purpose that I don't agree with, because then it goes beyond the value. It goes into, the, into my feeling of fairness as I <coughs> share that information. And it's a new thing, right? In the, in the 1980s, when we could all walk into a bank and there'd be the bank teller smoking a cigarette. Mm -hmm. and, and it, wouldn't even, it wouldn't even be in your mind that somebody would go and look through your, you, you were barely able to look through your transactions in your little booklet, never mind use them in a way. Whereas today, you go to, if you're some of the banks, let's not name names, but if you take a bank, one of the nice banks in the UK, where you take, you go to France and you're about to put uh, fuel in your car and uh, in France they book you for the whole as much as possible and then they reduce it, right? Then they uh, um, control it. You get a nice message saying, hey, you just put gas in your car in France. This is what tends to happen. Don't get scared. It'll get, it'll get adjusted. Fabulous. Love it. That's different from you getting a voucher in your inbox from some vendor that you can use in the next you might like or dislike that, but you'd like to know how that happened. Mm -hmm. So Realize would the conversation that. that we're having be completely different if we were all 20 years younger? <laughs> so yeah. we are talking Quite. about no, yeah, uh, yeah. the use of data and, and needing to be very careful, both as commercial organisations on behalf of our customers of making sure that we're looking after our customers' data, and, and equally that as consumers we all need to be very careful about thinking about who's using our data and how. But that isn't the mindset of people 20 years younger than us. Uh, actually, there's an openness to sharing data and a complete relaxed feel about making your data available, whether that's imagery, 
or your preferences or your, you know, your, your social um, presence. Is there a moral obligation for organisations to protect people who in a couple of generations won't be having perhaps the debates that we're having? I've done a couple of these sessions where I ended up being accused of being a total dinosaur about sharing of oh, data nice. for, healthcare, for healthcare reasons where, where it's a really tough one. But you're totally right. And, and there's a very thin line between being deeply patronizing and not accepting that the world is changing and we're just not with it. Yeah. But I think that's why it's worth having this societal debate. Sharing of data, is there a generational perspective here? Um, my view at the moment is that the combinatorial damage that can be done is unknown. The amount of combinations in which this can be used that can cause harm, unknown. So, so sharing it, should be down to the individual and how do we then control and educate and communicate so that if the individual says hey I get that if I share my x-ray it's good for society but I just don't want to mm -hmm. that we're in a position where we can do that uh, without causing such a burden that every time you get your phone like we're doing today with the cookie thing which is just mental which yes. is just like every, every website is like do you want to read these thousands of no. But yeah. is there not a, a sort of cultural and economic sense to this as well? I mean, it's one thing to say that different age groups are interested in different levels of, of data sharing. And certainly um, the ones that are now using uh, WhatsApp instead of Facebook don't want to broadcast. They want to converse, apparently. But what if you don't have the <coughs> access? So you're talking about sort of like a universal control access to all people whether they're on a feature phone or a supercomputer yeah. this is this is going to be incredibly hard to balance there's still going to be people who will have control of your data and you may not have that kind of access that's tom's point though that some of these things is data that you're creating because you are transacting with a bank mm -hmm. and it's a byproduct of the transacting of the bank mm -hmm. versus data that i am actually creating myself as my me being the source uh, social media data, right? So there's signaling versus data that I create versus data that is collected about me. And that I'm probably, if we give somebody, a professor in here, they'll give us another, the actual formal 25 category. But all of this is, is super complex. And then the translation to the scaffolding becomes combinatorially even more complex, which then leaves the, the CIO and Tom and people out that will try to run these systems in big companies sitting there scratching their head going what do i do so we go back to the simplification of actually what are the four things i want to do that help the rest of the organization organize this in a way that keeps the keeps the business going but builds the next evolution of things that i do want to do right and so finally uh, we've been discussing outside of this session as well uh, artificial intelligence and machine learning we've talked about transparency in this discussion giving people their data or, or explaining to them secondary data. AI and NML are not particularly known for their transparency or explainability. So can these technologies be helpful or is it more of a hindrance when you're trying to deal with data in a way that feels acceptable to, to large groups of people? I think when you talk about data in the context of machine learning, in the, in the first generation, Machine learning is just a set of algorithms that take your data and produce a result. What we're doing right now, not every company, but the Googles right now, um, they're taking data, right? And they have the capability to take your data and create second generation, second order attributes, mm -hmm. okay? That's what I would call, that's what's actually fondly called in industry deep learning, right? And when we get there in a more widespread manner, okay, we do have to face into this challenge of are, is machine learning bringing more transparency to the data or is it bringing more challenge right, to the data? Hmm. Because we, I don't think GDPR, even as it stands today, addresses that very, very well okay, because it's something that you know, certainly my organization, right, we're grappling with. I'm, pretty, I'm sure talking to others, others are grappling with that too because those second order attributes are being generated today, right? They're being generated through various mechanisms, machine learning included, and we don't have a codified way of governing it. I have a different perspective. Tom and I disagree with this as usual. <laughs> um, but it's very important not to chuck all machine learning into one bucket because there is no such thing. Machine learning is totally explainable in most cases. 
It's, I'm not saying it's not intractable, it's mathematics, and somebody, if you don't understand mathematics, you may not understand why. But 99% of the cases, you can go like this and go, that's why, and let me tell you why, and track it back. It's not complex. We bucket all machine learning into deep learning and other methods, and not even all deep learning. Um, and even then, to some companies that have such brutal amounts of data that they require these techniques, these massive pattern matching techniques, to do things. And in some cases, we don't mind when the machine says, we've got a tuber. And we have no problem trying to understand why, because it's obvious there's a big blob in the middle of my thing. We care so much if it misses it. So we have to relax a bit. We talked about in the previous session, if, if you recall, about education. It seems to come out in every single session. But we kind of continue to have examples where it sounds like machine learning made, a, made some kind of mistake. And the truth is humans made a mistake in using the machine learning, and we shouldn't be surprised. And we just need much better education about explainability in these things. When these things say 99 times out of 100 are perfectly explainable, they're just difficult to understand because they're deep mathematical engineering-y. The maglev example we used before, you know, we could repeat it here, right? If you have a train and it uses maglev and you're still going to use it even though you don't understand how superconductors man manage to get that thing going. But because, to your point, Tom, there's been sufficient generations of education and that now is, it's perfectly understood, safe, and we go with it. We're not quite there in this, in ML, which is why we make the, gro the gross, I'm gonna say gross generalizations of well, kind of unexplainable. No, no, it's, it's, just, it's just that you don't understand it, but it's just fine. We have to tread carefully here, or we do run the risk of creating a very difficult to break myth of this thing that thinks. No, it doesn't, no cleverer than a kettle. It just happens to have a lot of mathematics that I might not understand very well, right? Sarah, do you think that these technologies can be brought to established organizations? Or is it after their wave of, we're going to do everything with data, that they're getting weary when someone says, well, now we're going to do new data with AI? I hope that all organizations, even legacy organizations, can feel genuinely excited about the capability that is now available to us. You know, again, when I think of a previous organization with that I've worked in with, you know, 1960s, 1970s nuclear technology, to be able to retrospectively fit IoT capability into your 1970s technology in a way that those engineers could not have dreamt of, mm -hmm. to be able to, at a distance, monitor I don't know, vibrations in a turbine or, or mm. cracking in a graphite core, and then to be able to use machine learning to be able to interrogate that, understand it and respond to it in real time, that's an extraordinary opportunity. Mm. So uh, the sort of data techniques that we have available to us now, combined and augmented with, with AI and with ML, can be retrospectively applied to any legacy organisation, and, and the opportunity is huge. Mm -hmm. Okay, and so how do you then also explain that? Uh, whilst sort of coming coming back to an idea of, of risk, you know, uh, again, it is a public perception, but obviously it's one that affects CEOs as well, is, you know, if my data leaks or, or you know, Tom, you work with all kinds of data, customer data as well is going to be going to have a huge impact on um, reputation for companies. If you're incomprehensible data leaks, nobody's that bothered. If a customer data leaks, suddenly you've got that headline. But if you introduce um, more opaque technologies like AI and ML, are you just introducing more risk? I don't think the techniques, like Fernando was saying, actually obfuscate or data and like data definitions. I think we d disagree a little bit on the generative data, right? But by itself, the methods of artificial intelligence and machine learning can actually serve to clarify, right? Um, data, right? That of the ones that what you're using, yeah. the The concepts here would be once again we we talked about scaffolding, trust. These these concepts, like what I go back to, is codification. We need to codify, codify and make public. Maybe it should be the organization, the corporation, publicly stick st stating its codification, or it could be the government right, as GDPR, trying to codify, right, some of it, right? What we need to do is codify our usage, codify, right, our methodology so that the public trusts us with their data. Or what I talked about also is there's organizations out there now where you take all your personal data, give it to this organization, and the organization will pay you for your data. Right, so I, I don't think artificial intelligence ML is a good or evil in this situation, right? 
it's how you use artificial intelligence, AI and ML, right? That de- and how that impacts, right? The data of you, right? The person, mm-hmm. yeah. And so, Sarah, you mentioned generational differences. We may be over similar age around the table. Am I allowed to do that? Um, you are. Close enough. Um, is, it, is it just going to get to the point where the next generation has an idea about data? Um, it's seen the headlines. Some of them may be more technically trained as we see education change. Mm-hmm. Are we just waiting for our own extinction, basically, so that the problems go away? Or do we need to focus on this to make sure that we're supporting what's coming up? Well, it's Tom's point about codification. Um, the extraordinary thing that happens when there are billions of companies uh, interacting with consum- billions of consumers in different ways is that it starts to socialise a, a, a way of thinking about one's data and, 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 and how you use technology. And so your codification is growing organically, actually. Uh, so uh, accepted social memes about about you know what to do and how to use your data and to understand it are, are growing up around us. Mm-hmm. We can guide and we can influence and we can educate and every now and then we can have full-scale EU intervention. But actually, uh, uh, it, it's... it's uh, it's recognizing that these things grow organically uh, and that we need to shape that rather than try and lead it. If we try and uh, lead it and control it, then we'll fail. Mm-hmm. I, I think, um, f- I'm obviously not 20 years old, but I was you once, are. right? I'm, I'm young at, at heart, heart, at heart. I think for the consumers, especially around consumer identity, what we have to do is provide optionality, mm-hmm. right? So the um 20 year old today that doesn't care may care right at 40 when they develop some rare disease right that affects their uh insurance coverage or costs or things like that so wherever we are in each organization i think as as a society okay we have to cover the spectrum right of individuals and provide everybody the optionality right of sharing their data mm. so and that's a form of education in itself that is it? that absolutely is mm. yeah. final word to you I have, I have terrible trouble with generational issues because it, it makes me feel like we've been patronizing it not in this case but it makes you feel like you're speaking for them they're not in the room they should be in the room mm. even in education it's us that educate the 20 year olds so uh, we're thrifty as a, as a race, right? So, you know, the 20 year olds in some cases know, will know things that we don't. In some cases, they won't know any better. But the truth is, we can't predict. If we sit here and we suck every bit of information about how we all behave, we can't predict stuff that happens to us memes and, you know, a job which is a social person on Twitter becomes a job. I mean, that we can't predict any of this stuff. So, I'm. We have to be open-minded about how people want to use this data. Optionality, I totally agree with. Provide the option. And then as a society, provide guardrails that we think are you know, clear against our social values. In the same way that hurting any, anybody is totally unacceptable. In today's world, where my autistic 11-year-old can be hurt in many new ways, doesn't change hurt. So let's protect some of those things. I think we've got enough going on at those levels that that is going to keep us very busy but like everything we need to have the voices of everybody in society uh, and sometimes again just because we're old doesn't mean we say in spanish the devil knows more because he's old not because he's the devil and obviously this was a saying that comes from hundreds of years ago where age actually meant something today many of these young folks in accenture we have an enormous amount of them they are telling us how it is mm-hmm. so how do we get that feedback loop working better especially in the world of artificial intelligence where these, these nice people come at it, it's in their DNA, it's in their way they think of the world, maybe it's a new change. It's something that is gonna, that is gonna revolutionize. So I'm incredibly cautious and just trying to be, to your point in optionality, keep that open mind of optionality, give the option, but society must, must put a foot down on where do we feel as a society good lies and bad lies, and then police that. That's, all right then well, on that note we'll round things up but uh, thank you very much for joining us for the discussion pleasure thank you, thank you.